Congregational Church of Langsburg's online service. Thank you for joining with us here in this digital space. My name is Shelly and I will be your host for today. You can check in and let us know you are here by saying hello in the comments below. You can also share anything we need to hold space for there and our community will remember you in our prayers. Today is the final Sunday of Lent and Palm Sunday when we explore Jesus entering Jerusalem at the start of Holy Week. We have been participating in this season through different prayers, confessions, and fasting, like a detox for the soul. And as we explore, we have a few prayers and readings for us along the way. Blessings on your journey. Psalm 118, retold by Malcolm Geith. That we might shine amidst the seraphim, he made himself much lower than the angels, and dwelt with us that we might dwell with him. He did not stay amongst the cloudy symbols of abstract speculation, but became the cosmic cornerstone. And so, all angles of our approach to God must meet in Him. And yet, He was the stone that we rejected, though every builder must be built in Him. His one true light in every life refracted, this is His doing. It is marvelous. In each of us, His image is reflected, like light upon a stream, I trace its course, upstream towards the fountain whence it flows, and end in my beginning and my source. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of illness and disease in the world. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, give us strength and courage to make the changes that are needed in our lives reveal to us ways that we can help ease the pain of others and be a source of light in the world. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth Sunday of Lent. This has been a season that lasted 40 days, and it's been a season of fasting and reflection. It started on Ash Wednesday, and it ends this coming week on Monday, Thursday. Uh, we've traded our candle lightings each week for these candle snuffings to acknowledge our collective and accumulated sin as a people. And the resulting consequence is seen in the final seventh candle snuffed on Good Friday, which we'll have a live service here uh, for that. And this symbolizes the light of the world being snuffed out in death. Now, hopefully along the way, we've done some repentance work and can start afresh on actively living in the kingdom of God uh, around Easter. Now, the message of Palm Sunday, which is today, takes what Jesus has been about during his whole ministry and then embodies it entirely. Now, many people have placed their expectations upon Jesus and then entertained his actions and teachings to a point. Uh, but Jesus has claimed to be the long expected Messiah and it has gained quite a following. Now, the three specific expectations the people knew the Messiah would do were to claim the throne cleanse the temple and rally the people against Rome to reclaim their land from their occupation. 
Now, Jesus' ministry and teachings has been anything but this. He's reached out to the vulnerable. He's welcomed the outsider. He's even praised the Roman centurion. And he spoke the hard truth to many religious leaders along the way. And this made him stand out and then gain a following. But that following would dwindle come this week as he takes the radical love of God towards the world to its logical end, a self-sacrificial love shown in nonviolent resistance towards humanity's love of power. And the people don't like this stance, even though it is the ultimate end of what he's been claiming the entire time. Now, historically, we have desired to gain power and use that power for good. But the pursuit of power brings inherent violence upon our own souls that demands us to sacrifice certain values and practices, at least for a season until we can get what we want later on. This is what the Bible calls idolatry. Because how you get something is the very thing that shapes you into the person who has the thing you wanted. But when you desire love and goodness, but pursue power to enforce it or enact it, you have to do some unloving, th unloving things along the way to gain it. And then you become the kind of person that sacrifices love for the vulnerable for a position of power. And Christ said that you cannot serve two masters. So here Palm Sunday comes. Jesus acts out two of the three expectations of the Messiah. He claims the throne, he cleanses the temple, but he refuses to lead the military rebellion against Rome. And the people praise him as he fulfills these expectations, but then shout crucify him when he fails to give them what they want. Now historically, the gods were national mascots as the nations warred for territory and control. The most powerful nation had the most powerful god. And whoever won a war had bragging rights on the schoolyard grounds for having the most powerful God on their side. But Christ displays a different God, a God that does not seek to inflict punishment, pain, suffering, and judgment upon humanity in order to gain more power, but instead stands with all of humanity in solidarity of our suffering, and does this so perfectly that it defeats death altogether. The common enemy of the whole human race. So let's hear this passage read by my friend Aaron, and then we'll do some exploring on the other side. Good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron McConnell, and I will be reading from Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. After telling this story, Jesus went on towards Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Now, as a kid, I had a really cool bike. It didn't have any stickers on it or any markings and no logos at all. It was just cool enough all on its own. It had these really cool pegs on the back wheel for friends to stand on as we rode around the neighborhood. And it was this cool burgundy red and it had some really great handlebar grips. Now I rode to my friend's house and I left my bike in his front yard. And then we went, we're playing in his backyard. And I noticed a kid in the front yard removing my beloved handlebar grips. I took off sprinting, yelling, don't take my grips. Uh, we chased them down the street and past my house and my mom stepped out onto the porch of our house and threatened to call the kid's mother. So he sheepishly turned around, threw them back in our front yard where I grabbed them 
and put them back onto my bike in their prized position. Now today we have an interesting passage where Jesus orders someone to go grab a colt out of someone's front yard. Now a colt was a mode of transportation for the upper middle class, much like having a car in an urban context where many people take the bus or subway. So here in this passage, Jesus, Jesus orders his disciples to go get a colt out of someone's front yard and return it to him. Now upon reading this, it sounds a lot like the disciples try to sneak into the city and steal a car out of someone's driveway for Jesus. Maybe one of the disciples can like make a diversion while the other one slips off the lead of the post and quietly walks out the city hoping no one notices they got somebody's donkey. But uh oh, the owner sees him. Hey, what are you doing with my donkey? Now, I, I just kind of picture the disciples saying, well, the Lord needs it, and then bolting away as fast as they can so they don't get caught. And because of some divine Jedi mind trick that Jesus pulls off, the owner just says, oh, okay, cool. That's kind of how I've read this passage and interpret it, but that's not the emotion of this event. Now, there was a messianic expectation in the minds of all people that the future king would enter the city upon a cult that comes from their traditions and their stories. Uh, one of them is from Samuel, as David and Solomon enter the city on colts as kings. And then there's this prophecy out of Zechariah 9 that says this is how the Messiah would come and reclaim the throne. He would come into the city riding on a colt. Now, this is coming from the same people that saves an empty seat at the Passover table for Elijah's return. Still today, there's an empty seat at their table of the Passover because they enact scripts with symbolism. It's in the DNA of the people. So what if instead of the disciples committing grand theft donkey and a guy running after them crying, hey, bring back my colt, we find instead a people prepared for the Messiah at any time. What if every year there is a colt tied to this post in hopes that this is the year the Messiah comes to claim it? So the response, the Lord needs it. It's not an excuse to run off with a stolen donkey, but instead would fill the entire region with excitement and hope and a buzz. And then that would spread fast. Now Jesus seizes the expectations of the people through this act, claiming the throne as rightful king. But those expectations turn fast. Let's see what happens next. Now, if you remember the beginning of Luke's story, it starts with a census of the entire known world that's ordered by this guy named Quirinius. And this happened as Mary was pregnant with Jesus, about to give birth. And then it forces the whole world into upheaval as they travel back to their hometowns to register for the census. As you can imagine, many folks are not happy about this. There was one guy by the name of Judas of Galilee who gathered a following and led a violent resistance against the census. His followers told all the people not to register. And if they found anyone who did, they burned their houses to the ground and stole all their cattle. Yeah, nice guy, right? Now, Rome's response to uprisings like this was always the same. Crucify the leader and the followers scatter. But they didn't. Rome always mistook a lull in uprisings for genuine peace. So while Judas was crucified, his followers went into hiding. Now this Judas is actually mentioned in Acts 5.37 by a member of the Sanhedrin who said this, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him, but he also perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone because if this plan uh, or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be fighting against God. Now, Messiah figures always led rebellions, and they always ended up crucified. It was like this cyclical thing that just happened over and over and over again. Now, the time of our reading is Passover. Pilgrims are coming from all over into Jerusalem for the high holiday season. The population is going to grow from like 25,000 to somewhere around 750,000 within the week. And occupying Rome is on edge again, like they are every year. They increase their military forces in an area to accommodate the rise in population. And Judas of Galilee started a movement called the Zealots, who in the present time are waiting for the right time to strike again. And there's always little uprisings that happen when the lull becomes too emotional to maintain. But soldiers always rush in and suppress it, find the leader, crucify him. 
But every once in a while, a larger scale uprising, uprising happens and things get messy. Now, Pilate, as the Roman governor over the area, has the responsibility to keep this peace and keep the taxes flowing to the Caesar. That's his job. Now, the people spread their cloaks on the ground to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. Why do they do this? Has this ever happened in their history before? And the answer is yes, in 2 Kings chapter 9. Elisha, a powerful prophet, told one of his attendants to run down to Jerusalem and anoint Jehu as king and then run back home as quickly as he can. Seems cool? No. You see, Ahab was king, and a really bad one at that. So this was a secret transferring of power while Ahab was still on the throne, and it subverted an evil king. So when everyone found out that this happened, they placed their cloaks on the ground and proclaimed, Jehu is king. And then he ended up overthrowing the evil king, Ahab. Now in our passage, is there an evil king that the people want overthrown? Absolutely. So the cloaks here are symbolic of that expectation, not only of Jesus' claim to the throne, but what he will do with that authority. But he does not fulfill their expectation. He dies like all the rest. And his followers, they scatter like all the rest. But somehow, this one sustains throughout history. Now imagine a city on edge. Population is rising for the high holiday season. Roman guards have increased everywhere. Jewish pilgrims are flooding in, and they far outnumber the Roman military guards on duty. So in a display of power, the Roman governor, Pilate, does this little parade for everybody. He rides through Jerusalem on his war horse with soldiers in full military garb going behind and before him. Just a little message, don't try it. This is not your year. Then a little uproar happens as some Jews start to declare somebody else is king. And so it begins. The soldiers await their orders. Jesus in their sights as the leader to this rebellion. Now, there were four responses in the day to the, this Roman occupation. Nobody liked it. Uh, but the Ascends, they were a group that said, it's all screwed up. Just decide, let's stay out in the desert and find God there like a group of monastic monks. They don't need the Romans, they don't need the temples, they don't need the Jews, they don't need the Pharisees, the Sadducees, nobody. They just stay out in the desert. Now the Sadducees, complete opposite of the Ascend, said, yeah, it's all messed up and all is meaningless. Rome is too big to fight, too big to fail, so we might as well get rich. And they did. They ran the temple system and reaped all the profits. Now the Pharisees try to make peace with Rome and the Jews and try to walk this line of free will and fate by not making any bold moves and just kind of waiting to see what God does and trying to maintain personal holiness and public worship and then see what plays out. And Judas, the Galileans, started the fourth one, the Zealots. And they say that the Messiah will rally us together and God will bless our efforts of violent resistance. And if we don't fight, God will punish us for our lack of faith and our lack of holiness. So we need to take our nation back. So the group here asking the followers of Jesus to stay quiet, the Pharisees, falls right into their fears. We got a Messiah figure here riding in the town on a colt specifically for this purpose. People are declaring him king. This is an act of treason. The soldiers have their hands on their swords. They're just waiting for the order. The zealots have the hands on their swords. They're just waiting for their order. Tension is thick. Now Peter's actually gonna take up his sword and cut off an official's ear when they try to arrest Jesus. And Jesus tells them to cut it out, put it away. And then he heals the one who came to arrest him. Now, the Pharisees lose their minds because they know what happens next. Swords fly and crucifixions follow. Their response is very practical. Shut them up before we all die. Now, Jesus says, if I silence them, the stones will cry out. Now, interpreters are all confused about what this might mean. Uh, they don't have any consensus on this one. And I don't claim to have any insights on the final, you know, scholarly cl clarity on the issue. But I do have some pastoral reflections from the journey we've been on. These four groups have an interpretation of this one moment. And everyone ties an expectation onto Jesus in this moment. And he does not meet their expectations. And yet they all miss what God actually did. Because they couldn't get past their own aspirations of power. Now, these four groups are alive and well today, still, in how we expect God to move and what 
we expect that to look like. Now, Pastor Benjamin Kramer, one of my favorite pastors right now, he brings the message of Palm Sunday right into the present when he boldly st states, a Christianity that believes it needs a political party, president, legislation, and a nation to ensure its survival is a Christianity that actually dethrones Jesus as savior of the nations and advances the belief that Jesus needs a nation to be his savior. Jesus is Lord, period. Today's blessing of the Palms, benediction, is this underlying revolutionary blessing for all creation. That even when we fail, the rocks themselves cry this message of God's universal goodness. I hope you can quiet your aspirations long enough to hear and receive this blessing. Blessing of Palms. This blessing can be heard coming from a long way off. This blessing is making its steady way up the road toward you. This blessing blooms in the throats of women, springs from the hearts of men, tumbles out of the mouths of children. This blessing is stitched into the seams of the cloaks that line the road, etched into the branches that trace the path, echoes in the breathing of the willing colt, the click of the donkey's hooves against the stones. Something is rising beneath this blessing. Something will try to drown it out, but this blessing cannot be turned back cannot be made to still its voice, cannot cease to sing its praise of the one who comes along the way it makes. By Jan Richardson. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. What now? Well, you can participate. If you'd like to participate in our services, we would welcome your readings with a simple phone recording. You can also partner. If you'd like to give financially to ensure the continuation of this online service, there's a link at the bottom of your screen, and you can also subscribe. You may subscribe on YouTube or like our page on Facebook to stay updated with our online services. We hope you have found some hope, help, and healing today. See you next week. <laughs>